Welcome back to another episode of Plastic Weekly. We're trying the five on, five off thing again after uh, some decent reviews of, of YouTuber Albert Oak. So I brought in another guy that does videos. It's uh, Zachary Neal, Dr. Zachary Neal, I'm sorry, from Climbing Hold News and Reviews, joining me from Minnesota right now. I'm very jealous of the background you've got going on back there, man. Thanks for joining us. How's it going? It's going great. Thanks for having me. And yeah, this this wall is super sick. I can't wait to share more content with you guys from it. Yeah, man. I, 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 if I, if I can't climb, I'm not going to train. That stuff is way too boring for me. So I've lost all my muscles. I'm just desperate for climbing gyms to reopen back here. Also, so I can get a paycheck, I guess, would be the other uh, perk of, uh, of gyms reopening up here in Canada. Um, you know the deal. Five on five off. We're going to do four topics, five minutes each. Um, and if you're ready to go, we're going to talk about some climbing holds. Are you all set? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right, man. Let's do this. I'll get the timer up here and we will go. Where is it? Just got to find it. All right. I'm ready. So first question is, uh, your channel does like a, a great job of highlighting all the amazing holds that are coming out, all the new hold companies. And that makes it really hard, honestly, for, for like home wall owners and gym employees to figure out what to buy. Cause there's so much stuff on the market now. And so my question is like, when are we going to see some actual review content from uh, uh, from you that helps us narrow down like what to buy? Because you're showing us what we could buy, but man, I need help like figuring out how to adjust my budget for all the holds coming out. So, can we expect some like more critical um, review content from yourself in the future? For sure, yeah, and that's a common criticism I get. Like, hey, you need to be more critical. And what people don't realize is there is a screening process that's already in place. So I get emails from hold companies weekly saying, hey, man, will you review this? Will you check out this, make some content? And sometimes the answer is no. Like, your stuff is not quite up to speed yet. And I encourage people, like, hey, keep doing what you're doing. Let's come back in six months and let's revisit this. But as of right now, I've got too much work to do. And, you know, again, you're just not quite ready for this audience. Uh, so that's one thing that some people don't realize. Um, the other thing is that I am slowly becoming more critical. It's just taking some time. You know, you got to get comfortable in your own skin and everything. But it's also tough because the climbing hold industry is a very political place. And you have to be careful sometimes with what you say or you can receive backlash from companies, people, you know, people that aren't happy with what you said or even something that you might have not said. So that's pretty crazy. Uh, like if it's like as a straight up product, it's like, I guess what I'm asking is like, why can't you make content where it's, it's saying something along the lines of like, here is a hundred amazing holds from, you know, whatever company you want. Somebody just dropped like a new, let's say like a limestone line of holds, but I only have a $500 budget buying all of them costs a thousand. So like, couldn't, couldn't you do some content that says like, you know, uh, if you've only got this much money here are the best sets and kind of avoid these other sets. If you've only got a budget, like would that really ruffle feathers of, of hold companies where it's really just like buying advice? So you'd be surprised. I think it could ruffle <laughs> others. Uh, but that being said, I've got the best setup here to be able to test holds like nobody else can. And that's something that I'm learning as I've just recently started here with this new Kumiki Everactive um, wall setup is, you know, you could test holds at different angles. And yeah, you're right. Like some holds are better at some angles. Some holds are not appropriate for other angles. I mean, we all know that to be true. But there's a lot of variability based on the angle of the wall, how hard you climb. So I think I am going to be able to provide a lot of, you know, more like positive based criticism in terms of directing people to what they might actually want now that I can test all the angles. In in a lot of like review industries, the standard, like let's say with cars or something, or obviously that the dollar amounts are way bigger than with holds. But generally, it's implied that when you release a new product, you give it to the media for them to like try out for better or for worse. Like some people might give your car a, a bad review or whatever. But it's just kind of implied that, you know, if you believe in your product, uh, you're okay with sharing it with people and you assume some people will like it more than others. Like I understand that that climbing holds is a smaller industry, but it, do you think that's maybe a reasonable expectation for hold companies to eventually like, let's say a big company like a kilter or a kingdom, they, they come out with like a huge feature set and they send some stuff automatically to journalists like yourself and say, Hey, you know, go to town. If you love it, tell them if there's stuff you don't like, say that too like is that realistic or are you expecting whole companies like wouldn't 
be able to like stomach that kind of like opening for criticism. So I think it is realistic and we need to get there. Um, the problem is we're not there. Um, I have had predecessors to Climbing Hold News reviews. So Climbing Hold reviews was uh, very big for about 10 years yeah. um, from Jeremy Dowsett in Canada. And uh, he got lawsuit threats based on the content that he made, which I think is completely inappropriate. I mean, again, like I'm all about being psyched, being positive, sharing that psych with people. My goal is not to destroy a company or a product. So I think there's like a very happy medium that we need to find as an industry. That's really interesting. Like I've, I've had interactions too, where like there was, we've only got 15 seconds left, but I once, somebody asked me on Instagram for advice about like what jugs to buy. And I mentioned one company and I got an angry Instagram message from a different company. They were mad that I like didn't mention their holds, which is entirely unrealistic. And, and that ends, unfortunately, this discussion, which is I'd love to talk about more in the future. Let's stay roughly on the same vein, which is kind of about climbing hold marketing, um, which, you know, if I'm being super critical, I feel like a lot of your channel is marketing and some of it is direct. Like you do ex like explicitly say you work with some companies, including the one I'm about to talk about. Um, and so I, I wanted to talk about the stoked climbing's um, shaper party series, where the idea is we're going to hire a, a presumably a legendary shaper. They started with Louis Anderson, which is as big a name as you can get. And we're going to have them shape a small set of holds. And we're going to try and market this to gyms and home walls and kind of run off of this guy's clout, basically, right? Like the holds are, are small, they're cheap. It's not super flashy. And it's a really interesting approach to marketing. I know you work with these guys. Like I'm pretty sure you have some kind of uh, financial relationship but can you talk to me about about that just whole idea and how you see it kind of maybe working or not in the industry like what do you think the trajectory is for that style of uh, collaboration with shapers yeah so i think it's a super cool idea it's no secret i'm involved with it travis and i are good friends um, you know, the idea honestly is to highlight shapers, which is something that's missing in the industry in a lot of ways. We highlight the hold companies, but we don't highlight the shapers themselves. So the names aren't really known out there. And we want these names to become household names. We want people to be psyched about their shapes, to understand that there's a style that each of these shapers creates based on their holds. So I think it's a really cool idea. Um, yes, it is a little bit of a different way of marketing because we are marketing towards a home wall audience because they are smaller shapes. You just can't realistically have giant shapes on a home wall. It takes up too much real estate. So you need these smaller like screw on shapes like Louis released so far here for January. Um, and I think they're super cool. I definitely think they have their place. I know there's also gyms that are getting them, Dino Climb, um, Stephanie up in Seattle. I know she's got a set. I think she's planning on setting it Climb Tacoma and her home wall. So they're getting out there. And I think this is just the beginning. And I can see much larger sets and shapes coming from Stoked as well. Does like most of the time, if you like name drop shapers names, the people you're really targeting are like people that have worked in the industry for a while. Right. So if you're targeting these holds at home walls, for the most part, do those people really like resonate when you drop a name like Louis Anderson? Is that really like an effective sales technique for that market? Yeah, I mean, we want it to resonate with them. We want these names to become known. Uh, but yeah, you're you're right in that, again, your average Joe who has a Woody, you know, eight by eight or whatever, you know, they're probably not going to care that much about the shaper's name, but they're going to care about the shapes. And we hope that that then links to the shaper being known as well. Hmm. Um, the the two kind of ways I think that um, hold companies have kind of like innovated in the past and how they market their shapes are like on one end you do uh, a hold subscription, which isn't really marketing, I guess, but it's a way to get like small, um, like, um, you know, it's fairly cheap monthly prices for like either one shape or a couple of shapes. Um, whereas on the other end, there's this approach that kind of, I feel like 2013 was a big year for it with Kilter and Kingdom, as I mentioned before, where they drop like an entire line right away. And the thing is like, you got to buy them all because they all look so sick and you can build, you know, an entire 50 foot route with just this one set. And it's two really opposite ends of the spectrum. One is like make big money purchases on one side for a huge set. And the other is just spend 50 bucks, get a couple shapes every once in a while. Um, when you look at those two opposite ends of the spectrum, do you, do you have a, a feeling like 
one or the other may become the dominant um, uh, the dominant method for trying to to get attention for your holds. Yeah, I think it all depends on who your audience is. You know, smaller shapes, the monthly subscriptions, uh, e grips, first dibs. It's dead now. Man, do I wish it was not dead. I had a subscription to that. I got some super cool holds. You know, when I was just starting out, um, that has its place for sure. Your, you know, giant mega gym is probably not going to get a lot of use out of something like that. You know, they're going to spend several thousand dollars on X cult evolution fiberglass. And, you know, that's just the marketing that they're going for. Um, so it just depends on who your audience is. And the home wall audience has grown a ton with COVID because tons of people put plywood up in their houses. They started building, you know, climbing walls when they couldn't get to the gym like yourself right now. And uh, that's become a huge thing. So we're seeing that become kind of its own uh, its own target audience as well. Nice. And you ran out the clock perfectly. Nice job on, on that answer too. Nailed it, dude. Uh Let's talk about hold manufacturing. So again, it's been a long time since I've been a setter, long time since I've been involved with like buying shapes. Um, so it was probably like 2013 when I last spent time thinking about like, you know, who's making holds and who's all this stuff. So my question right now is I want you to like fill me in on the gossip of pouring houses. The last time I checked in, it was basically like Aragon was king shit of crap mountain or whatever that ridiculous phrase was like if it wasn't aragon and na it, it wasn't good quality plastic um since then i remember talking to ian powell and i that was at the time where you started to see stuff coming from like danamond over in europe for kilter and na companies so like what's the what's the lay of the land with uh pouring houses right now who's who's the hot company to get your stuff poured by for sure. Great question. So yeah, Aragon is still definitely a force to be reckoned with. Uh, they've got great companies like Method Grips. Yeah, they've got Kilter. Um, they've got a lot of others as well. Uh, so they were a dominant poorhouse for a very long time. There are competitors now as well. So you've got Vertical Solutions and Proxy, who has picked up Blocks and Blue Pill in terms of their plastic. Uh, they've also got Menagerie, they've got Andy's other brand Formic, they've got Toe Jam with Chris Neal, they've got Capital. That's a huge, huge reckoning force to mess with nowadays. And then you've also got Peak Polymers, which is based out of Ohio. They've got Decoy, you know, they've got other brands as well. There is, uh, of course, Composite X over in Europe, which, you know, to play with those guys, you do got to pay the big bucks. That is really, really good plastic comparable to anything else, if not, you know, again, really good plastic. Um, and then there's also some secret stuff that's coming that I can't even tell you about yet. <laughs> uh, there's, there's rumors of a new poorhouse that's picking up some smaller companies, and there's also talk of big boys joining them. So there's a lot that could be changing in the next few months to, you know, six months a year. Interesting. Um, in the time period I'm talking about, like 2013-ish, the the big discussion was about like can you match colors? Obviously, was it was a huge one, right? Because Aragon colors were were what everybody based their their color matching off of. And one of the companies you mentioned, Proxy, along with a bunch of other smaller poor houses at the time, everybody claims to color match and they get close, but it's never quite right. I was kind of struck that you mentioned that like Blue Pill and I can't remember what the other company was. Uh, that's wow. getting, blocks. Those are are very well respected names. Um, is, is, is have you seen the quality really rise from these companies? Because Proxy's been around for a while, but frankly, I didn't hold them to the same standard in terms of quality and color again eight years ago. But are they actually stepping up to the point where they're like basically like S tier um, manufacturers, or are they just are they just benefiting from the fact that so many people are shaping that they now have product to sell, even if it's not as good? No, they've stepped up to the plate. You wouldn't be attracting these names were your products not to be good. There's several other big European companies that I know have talked to them, figuring out final details, et cetera. Um, those companies would not be interested were it not a good, you know, superior product. Um, definitely on mark with Aragon. Again, everybody's going to tell you something different. There have been different studies that have come out that say this plastic's better, this plastic's better. It just depends on how you cut it. But honestly, I think most of the plastic that's out here nowadays with technology advances, it's great, you know, and, and from a commercial standpoint, it's going to last, um, you know, it, it's, it's all quality stuff. 
back back in the day if you didn't have your stuff poured by aragon the chances that gyms were going to order you especially for their big opening order was really low frankly right like you might as well just get all those big aragon companies everything looks awesome for your opening day are are these other companies kind of breaching into that space of being like a you know your big opening a couple hundred thousand dollar buy have they reached that level for real hundred percent vertical mm. solution is building gyms these gyms have proxy holds in them you know to the nth degree yeah they pick up some of these other companies as well you've also got a lot of overseas gyms opening up um, again i know just from personal experience method grips has been shipping a whole lot of holds overseas and uh, distributors are putting those in gyms so there's a lot going on. And then you've also got other distributors like Premium Holds, who's bringing Cheetah, Squadra, things like that. Highly coveted holds that are ending up in gyms for their opening set. So yeah, you betcha, it's not the only uh, force anymore. It's very cool that you're seeing like more global holds getting into North America. Like that's that's been a, an amazing change for the industry. All right, last question. It's it's a little more uh, a little more out there, just kind of an opinion based question. But let's let's posit the idea of we we have like a, a hold shaper hall of fame and a hold shape hall of fame, and I'm going to ask you to nominate. Uh, you know, there's a bunch that could be in it, so this is basically just your opinion, right? But if you had to nominate a hold shaper of the last ten years, of the last decade, um, who who would you? nominate for that hall of fame and on top of that could you name three sets of holds they don't have to be from that person but let's say three sets of holds that you think deserve to be in like the hold shaping hall of fame what uh what do you think for sure so it's got to go to louis anderson again he is one of the most prolific shapers of the last 10 to 15 years he has shaped for just about every hold company you know that was popular and big during that time and a lot of them that weren't popular and big his shapes are everywhere. If you're climbing in a gym, you're climbing on his shapes in some shape or form. Um, and again, I remember like the old school days with like climate and, you know, I was living in California at the time. I climbed at Hangar 18 gyms, climbed on tons of his shapes, classic shapes, found those holds in other gyms as I was, you know, moving across the country at various points in my life. So for without a doubt, it's him. And then as far as hold shapers, um, or as far as the hold sets themselves go, I'm going to stick with holds that Louie made just because it's such a broad category. I can't even begin to cover that. Um, so start with climate, you know, those Huecos they made, and I don't even know what the Huecos are called anymore because their you, website. Do you mean like the, the limestone Huecos or like the old like halos or whatever they were, the... I'm going to have to give it to the halos. The were they halos. like dual techs on the outside? Yep. Yeah, yep. I think those were the halos. Yeah, yeah, uh, I mean, those are classic holds. And granted, you know, Louis went on to transform those halos into the, the you know, Huecos for kingdom climbing, those big dual tech stuff with that too. Uh, he's just, he's everywhere. So that's probably one of the first sets. Uh, climate, of course, not super relevant these days, but man, they made some cool stuff back in the day. Um, from there, you know, again, another big company Louis shaped with, So Ill, the Smooth series. That was one of the first smooth lines of holds, I think, that a major company had. Smooth being just not like texture and surface designs and things like that. Um, and I know they're planning on even expanding that line. So that's, again, it's still relevant. Those holds are still cool. And then um, the last one I have to say would be like his rails from Legacy Climbing. Uh, his own company. I reviewed those last year. Super cool holds, very versatile. Saw them in comps. Um, Christopher Neal with Toe Jam just released the homage rails, which were a homage to the old stuff he did for Crater. So just that style. He's so good at his rails. So I definitely would say him. Uh, I dropping the Crater holds name just like took me back for a second. To, <laughs> uh, no, so the 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 one question I want to uh, bring up about so you you took Louis Anderson as the guy and I don't disagree. He's probably one of the top five, even international hold shapers for, for just like uh, their influence on the scene. But how would you feel if I said that his influence in my opinion has, has waned and that's in what I think because his holds have become less relevant in the comp scene, specifically like the international style of competition, like holds don't have, have like texture anymore on the comp scene. Whereas 
things. We talked about this earlier. I think Louis's biggest strength and contributions are the incredible textures that he's put on some holds. Um, do you think he's he still has the like international relevance? Um, because it feels to me it's become more of a North America like gym uh, uh, kind of influence. Definitely still huge, but not so much on the international comp scene. Yeah, he definitely still has relevance. I mean, he's making shapes again, not to drop him again, but method grips. He's making shapes for them. They're shipping internationally. Um, his shapes are in every gym. They just are. And yeah, they're not necessarily in like comp scenes, uh, but that's just because Louis doesn't make like slick fiberglass, you know, macros, or right. at least he has so far. Um, that's really the only reason I think we haven't seen it, but yeah, his influence on the, on the industry is it's everywhere. You look at his texture that he did on the surface of holds, his rock style holds that ended up still being somehow comfortable. <laughs> I just released a stratum with method, which I've climbed on those. They look great. They climb great. Um, yes, they're more old school, but maybe we need a little bit more old school. I don't disagree, man. I'm honestly getting a little bit bored of like everything I grab nowadays is just like smooth. I'm like, give me, give me, make me think about a thumb catch. Like make me engage my brain just a little bit, right? Like I miss that stuff. But anyway, that is, that is time. That's perfect. Well done. Uh, well done, done Dr. Uh, Dr. Z. Uh, that was awesome. Yeah, bro. I really enjoyed it. It was super fun and I appreciate you having me on and talking about these things and yeah, definitely love to do it again. Awesome, dude. So uh, make sure if, you, uh, if you've if you been watching this, uh, you are, if you're hearing this, uh, make sure you go follow Climbing Hold News and Reviews on YouTube and on Instagram. That's where you'll see everything first. I think that's your slogan even is like, see it here first on, uh, on Climbing Hold News and Reviews. And honestly, it's true. I don't follow anybody else that aggregates all of the, uh, the Climbing Hold stories. On, uh, on Instagram and YouTube. So check it out. Hopefully some more review content in the future, which I'm psyched about. I want to see you just roasting companies anytime they do uh, <laughs> some <laughs> shitty holds. Uh, and, uh, and of course, thank you for watching. Uh, uh, thank you to all the uh, Patreon donors, especially the G5. If you want Plastic Weekly stickers or if you want to ask a question in a future episode, you can donate uh, at patreon.com slash Plastic Weekly. Join our Discord if you like talking about all things climbing and all things competition. Uh, and of course, make sure you like this video and uh, subscribe for whatever comes out next. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in the next one.